All right, and here we go with our second day of human impacts. And today what we're really going to talk about is this concept, this idea of a monoculture. If you take a look at this picture, you are seeing a monoculture. We have taken this land, we have removed everything else from it, and now we are using it to grow only a single species. This is all the same thing that's growing in this area. That is what a monoculture is. Now, if you tried to look at nature, you're not going to see a monoculture. In normal environments, you're going to see something like this. In a deciduous forest, our local climax community, you're going to find deciduous trees and pine trees. You're going to find shrubs and bushes. There will be grass and flowers, vines, all sorts of different things. Uh, just plant life living here, let alone the uh, bio the other biotics, the animals that then would be living in this area as well, right? This is how nature is supposed to be. Not like this. But this is not something we hear a lot about, especially here in the U.S. So let's talk a little bit about it. Now, the term monoculture, once again, comes down to the Latin. Hopefully you guys remember what mono means as one, and culture is a combination of things in ecology of the biotics. So what we're saying is a monoculture is going to be an area where only one species is allowed to live there. All the other ones we eliminate, which is interesting because it doesn't just mean farmland like that is a monoculture. It also means something like high-density beef farming, which is what you see here, is also a monoculture. We have removed all the other organisms from this area of land, and we are only allowing one species then to grow there. Now, monocultures are unbelievably dangerous. They're a terrible choice overall, but I do want to make sure that everybody understands they do have an advantage. That advantage is they are the most efficient food production for use of space that we have yet. We may find something better, but as of right now, this will grow the most food in the least area the most efficiently out of all of our farming and agricultural methods, which you'll start to understand then why it's being used worldwide. But when we eliminate all the other species and we reduce it down to one, remember variety, that natural variation is super important for an organism's survival. It guarantees that when an illness invades, not everybody is susceptible to it. It makes sure that when climate changes, some individuals have the right traits in order to survive it. Right? Variation is needed for a species to stick around on this planet. And basically, what we're doing with monoculture is we are removing variation. We are cutting it down. So let's take a look historically at an example. Anybody recognize the nasty brown looking thing over there on the right? What kind of vegetable is that? If you've been through social studies, you probably will recognize this. You might have actually even seen that picture. Anyone? Anyone? I see Alex is listed as being here. What do you think, Alex? What is the brown, wrinkled, nasty-looking thing? Yes, Maddie! Potato! This is the Irish potato famine. All right, millions of people died because the uh, the peasants in Ireland were growing one type of potato. And when the blight arrived and it infected that potato because all the potatoes were the same, they were all more or less genetically identical, they were all susceptible to the disease. And as it ravaged through fields, destroying these crops, it destroyed the basis of their food system. Thank God that could never happen to us here in America. 
where our food system is so diverse, where we don't rely on a single crop in order to maintain our economic and nutritional health, boy, if we did, that would be bad, huh? Oh, yeah. Anyone know what crop it is that all of America relies on for its economy and its food? We eat it, we can it, we cook it, we grind it, we use it as flour, we use it as sugar. Absolutely, guys. Yeah, corn. And right now, America grows the world's supply of corn. And if something were to come in, and start wiping out those cornfields, because once again, they are all a monoculture, we would be in a world of hurt. See, right here, once again, another monoculture field, and something got into this batch because those plants were grown so close together, and I apologize for the quality. You can see it wiped out this whole plot. Now, if it could start to spread further... You can imagine what it's going to do to the entire rest of this field. Just plot by plot, wiping them out. So when we monoculture, we are effectively taking something that looks like our top forest picture here, laser pointer, and we are turning it then into something that looks like this. And the bottom picture, if you got a little bit of OCD going, the bottom picture looks beautiful, right? Things are in rows, it's nicely angled, everything is uniform. But for the health of environment, that's really, really bad. See, the key term here, notice red. We haven't seen red in ages. This idea of biodiversity is what everything in ecology is based around. We want to keep a good, healthy biodiversity. Anything that reduces the biodiversity is going to reduce the ecological health of that area. The picture here is beautiful in terms of biodiversity. You're seeing tons of different species all clearly living in the same area, let alone you can tell differences in plant life around the water and away from the water. Uh, you can tell there's like this little bush growing near the lion's butt, stuff like that, right? Like these things are all good indicators of the health of an environment. Now, if you want to understand why, take a look at this. And once again, I apologize that this didn't transfer great, but this is directly out of a New York State living environment regents. And here we have a very complex food web, right? There's all sorts of different things in here. Now, let's imagine that a disease comes through and it wipes out the seed-eating birds, right? These guys right here are all dead. Well, what is the owl going to do for food? If the seed-eating birds are completely eliminated... Just imagine an X over them. This is now a blank spot. There's no energy to follow from the birds into the owl. So what will the owl do for food? Take a look at the diagram and think about the choices available to it. So there's no more seed-eating birds. It means that the owl is going to have to eat more mice eat more squirrels, and eat more rabbits. No problem. If these are eliminated, these three other ones can probably handle the additional pressure that's put on them, even though the foxes are now going to be eating those same three more as well, because both of these two ate those seed-eating birds. No problem. You have a big, robust, healthy food web to fall back on. The elimination of one species is not a be-all, end-all. It's not a death sentence for this environment. But look at this one. Let's imagine a less biodiverse food web. What happens if we eliminate the rabbits? Can the mice alone handle all of the increased predation from hawks and snakes? 
Maybe. Probably not. Probably going to see the mouse population dive. And when this population dives because the snakes and the hawks are eating them, then the snakes and the hawks are going to start having issues because the next generation won't have enough mice to keep them alive. They're going to start to die. Everything falls into chaos. When you reduce the biodiversity and we go from a good, healthy environment like this that can withstand getting knocked around a little bit and we move into one like this that can't withstand it, ecological collapse becomes a very real possibility. Do you guys remember the brown tree snake for the invasive species we went over in Guam? Remember, it had eliminated 9 out of 11 native bird species, 2 out of 3 native bat species, and more than half of the native lizard species, and that had resulted in 34 species of plants now starting to uh, decline, right? Because once again, it looked like this, then that tree snake came in, and this is what was left. Far, far less. Way less stable. So, we today, I want to examine one example of this, and this is one that we generally don't hear about living in America like we do, and that is palm oil. Alright, so palm oil is an incredibly lucrative uh, agriculture. So, if you take a look, the leaves of the palm oil tree are used as fertilizers. The base of the tree, the stalk, is used as furniture, usually wicker and stuff like that. And then you've got other stuff, the stuff that falls off of them, once again used for fertilizer. We take the uh, palm nuts, which are these little reddish uh, fruits up here. This is what one looks like up close. And we squish them to get the oil out of it. And then the leftover fiber and shells go to fuel the, um, in order to boil them down. And then the palm oil itself, uh, the stuff that we don't use, once again, goes back into fertilizer and for biodiesel, let alone the actual use of palm oil itself in food and other service goods. So this makes, like, gangbusters in money. Right, a palm tree is worth a lot to har let them grow and then harvest them. To give you an idea of the number of goods that all have palm oil in them, take a look at what you see here, because all of these used to use other fats, and then as people pushed for less of the bad fats and more of the good fats, we discovered palm oil. It could be produced cheaply, it provided a lot, and we started using it as a fat filler in just about all of these. Right? This is an unbelievable amount of stuff that all uses palm oil. But what is palm oil actually doing? Well, here is our use scale. Right, so the use in food from 2007 to 2019 has gone from below 30, right about here, up to about 50. So it's not quite doubled. The use in industrial processes went from uh, just about halfway up to 40, so 35, up to about 72. Huge increased more than double in a slightly over 10 years now you have to ask yourself all right if we have uh doubled our global consumption of palm oil in each one of these it, this number over here that you're seeing is a million metric tons of it so this was 35 million metric tons now up to 72 million metric tons where are we getting that from well, what they're doing is they're going into rainforested areas, clear-cutting the rainforest, and then planting the palm olives. Or palm oil, excuse me, not olives. So here you can see this little stream is the separation between who owns the land on the top 
and who owns the land on the bottom. This bottom one is what it should look like. This top one is now what it does look like. The arguments for this are actually really commonly used. And if you take a look at this, basically what this is saying is a natural forest is going to be subsistence-based. You're just going to be in there trying to gather and collect the stuff that you need. The market economy, therefore, is very weak, and the community there is indigenous, just the people who live there who rely on it. Now, as we move this way, as we move from the natural forest to agricultural, to palm oil plantations, to the certified high-density palm oil plantations, you see what's going to happen is the market economy is going to improve and the dominant community is going to change. It's kind of like if some places here in New York State, uh, let's say an apple orchard, was trying to promote the government to subsidize them and give them money, and they're going to claim that it's going to increase jobs, but then in actuality what they do is they don't, hire the local people who live there they ship in migrant workers who they have to pay less and for a little bit more information based on this Over the past 50 years, well over half of the world's tropical forests have been destroyed. Forested land is still being cut, decimated, or burned at a rate of over a full football field every second of every day. Many vertebrate animal species have already gone extinct as a direct result of this wholesale destruction of their forests in the name of commerce and development. Most scientists agree that within the next 10 to 20 years, if the rate of deforestation continues unabated and unchecked, hundreds or even thousands of the other plant and animal species currently found there will simply disappear. The forests are no longer seen as a wonderful source of biodiversity and as a national heritage and a national treasure to be protected with pride and patriotism, but instead are now seen as a cheap source of money and profits by government officials and corporations. The most recent efforts to destroy the remaining forested region has been the pursuit of producing oil from genetically cloned palm trees in places where lush tropical forests once stood. Millions and millions of tons are produced now every year. It's a very cheap oil, and it's the, very, the cheapest oil in the world trade, actually. And it's essentially flooding the world's supermarkets. If you look at the ingredients on almost any can of anything in a supermarket, you'll find some reference to palm oil. We greatly fear that, that orangutans, gibbons and others of our family will be following, will be following into extinction as a result of this, this trade. The demand for palm oil uh, is insatiable and the government has been using this as an excuse to cut down forest and they cut down forest in places that are totally unsuitable for growing oil palm but they've got the timber. They won't understand that the, their most valuable resource in the long term is sustainably managed rainforest. That will yield far more economically than any monoculture, any short-term gain you get from cutting the forest down. Because of the lack of uh, effective protection of, of uh, forest, especially in, in Indonesia now, there's a, a huge wholesale conversion of, of lowland forest into, into oil palm plantations. It's uncontrolled. And Borneo essentially is going up in smoke as this process of conversion to palm oil happens. I mean, it is grim, it is desperate, and there have been forecasts by 2020 the forest will be virtually gone. 
if the current trend of activities continues. It's quite extraordinary how much of the rainforest, and especially in Borneo, has been, has been replaced by, um, by palm oil. Uh, Eastern Sabah, for example, in, in, in Malaysia, North Borneo, if you drive through Eastern Sabah, you're driving essentially through one enormous palm oil plantation. Um, not just of one species either, but of one clone of one species. So there's absolutely no biodiversity at all. The oil palm plantations, it's sick because they're not providing local work for local people. They're bringing in their own people from outside and the local people are worse off with their forests gone and with no jobs. So that is really sad and really irresponsible. And I suppose it comes down to the government shouldn't be allowing so much activity from outside. Uh, they should be looking after their people better. <laughs> So that kind of gives you guys a little bit of a breakdown for exactly what the palm oil monoculture looks like. And it's kind of important to understand the area where they're doing this. How they're doing it is by cutting down those rainforests. Now, in a single rainforest, we have found substantial evidence that a single tree, one tree in the rainforest, has a greater biodiversity than a hundred acres of forest in New York. So even from like an economic side, we're trying to make the scientific argument to these people that they need to stop because we don't know what else might be living in that rainforest. Just in a single tree, we may find a cure for cancer. We may find some other new trait that will allow us to genetically engineer bacteria that will consume plastic or other human waste. Like, we have incredible options there, but not if the biodiversity of that area is annihilated before we have the chance to learn it. So our monocultures are a threat to the biodiversity of an area. The loss of that biodiversity not only affects the organisms that live there, but then possibly other ones like ourselves. Each day this week, we're going to be going up in severity and complexity. We started with forest fires, and how humans have started to influence and work with that. Today, we're getting into the monocultures, Tomorrow, we're going to start looking into industrialization and progress movements and the effect that has. And as all of this builds up, on Friday, we'll be talking about climate change, the biggest, the broadest, and probably the most dangerous thing that human beings have done to this planet. So I hope to see everybody tomorrow. Keep working on your final project. Double check in Schoology for that folder that has all the work listed in all the files.